time to time on The Living World, we come across a story that seems on the surface to be a little far-fetched, but on digging deeper reveals that there might be something in it after all. Such a story is that of Mokele Mbembe, a creature reputed to live in the swamp forests of the Congo Basin in Africa, and a creature that some scientists believe to be a relic from a bygone age, in short, a living dinosaur. Our story begins, though, not in Africa, but in Babylon, the Babylon of King Nebuchadnezzar around 600 BC. At that time, the Ishtar Gate was due for refurbishment, and an unknown craftsman was instructed to create a series of bas reliefs of images of animals on the bricks, glazed in blue, yellow, white and black. He chose three animals. There were lions that looked like lions, bulls that resembled bulls, and dragons that looked the product of an unbridled imagination. On what then had the artist modelled his creations? The lion would have been present in that area. The bull, almost certainly, the aurochs, a wild predecessor of our domestic cattle. It was not found in Mesopotamia at that time, but was living in Eurasia until the last one died in Lithuania in 1627. The artist may have seen it for himself on a distant journey. But what of the dragon? Could that too have been based on reality? There is mention in the book of Bell and the Dragon, from the Apocrypha, that a strange creature was kept in the temple of the supreme god Bell, lord of the world, for the populace to worship. That is, until Daniel came along. And in that place there was a great dragon, or serpent, which they of Babylon worshipped. And the king said unto Daniel, Wilt thou also say that this is of brass? Lo, he liveth, and eateth, and drinketh. Thou canst not say that he is no living God, therefore worship him. Then said Daniel, I will worship the Lord my God, for he is a living God. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. And that's just what Daniel did, with a pill made of pitch, hair, and fat. This he put in the dragon's mouth, and so burst in sunder. Exit one dragon. Or was it a dragon? Could it have been a snake, or a lizard, or even a dinosaur? We pick up the story again many centuries later, in 1887, when the German archaeologist Robert Koldeway excavated the Ishtar Gate, saw the glazed dragons, and with recent reconstructions of fossil finds of dinosaurs in his mind, declared, The Iguanodon of the Cretaceous layers of Belgium is the closest relative of the dragon of Babylon. There were, though, no dinosaur fossils known to be available to the Babylonian artists. So, might they have modelled the dragon on a living creature that had been seen, like the aurochs, in some foreign land? It's known that Babylonian travellers frequented the one area that might hide strange and unknown animals, the jungles of West and Central Africa. Significantly, a few years before Koldeway's discovery, glazed bricks, similar to those on the Ishtar Gate, were brought back from Liberia, the finder was Hans Schomburg, an animal collector who worked for the director of the Hamburg Zoo, Karl Hagenbeck. Schomburg returned to Germany, not only with the dragon bricks, but also with tales of curious creatures, including a huge monster, half elephant, half dragon, which had frightened away all the hippos from a local lake. Hagenbeck sent another expedition to look for the dragon. In his book he recalls, on the walls of certain caves in Central Africa, there are actual drawings of this strange creature. From what I have heard of the animal, it seems to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the Brontosaurus. At great expense, I sent out an expedition to find the monster. But malaria got the better of them, and not only did they fail to find the creature, they couldn't even find the lake. The monster, though, was not new to the literature. In 1776, French missionaries wrote about the track of an unknown animal they'd found in the forest. It must be monstrous. The prints of its claws are seen on the earth and formed an impression of about three feet circumference. It's estimated that the creature must have been the size of an elephant, but elephants, alas, do not have clawed toes. In the late 19th century, Alfred Aloysius Smith, otherwise known as Trader Horn, came across stories of an enormous dragon-like river beast in Gabon, and in the Cameroons he heard about an animal that left three clawed, frying pan-sized footprints in the mud at lakesides. But perhaps the most interesting account of the monster came from a German geographer who in 1913 
was sent to survey the Cameroons, then a German colony. In his report, he devotes a substantial section to Schomburg's mysterious creature and to what he described as the narratives of natives. The animal is said to be of a brownish gray color with a smooth skin, its size approximating that of an elephant. It's said to have a long and very flexible neck and only one tooth, but a very long one. Some say it's a horn. They call the animal Mokele Mbembe. Except for a few isolated stories between the wars, little was heard of Mokele Mbembe until 1976, when Roy Mackle, a biologist at the University of Chicago, became interested in the creature. Originally, I was lecturing at the university in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a chap named James Powell, who was a crocodile expert, had been studying crocodiles in West Africa, in Gabon. And he had received information from the natives, from the Fang, of an animal called Nyamala, which was described as having a body the size of a hippopotamus with a long head, neck, and a long tail. This sounded very much like a primitive sauropod, those dinosaurs with the eight vegetable material and have a long head and neck, much like the brontosaurus, except that this animal was described as being very much smaller. Roy Mackle and James Powell were clearly hooked and agreed that an expedition should be mounted. But where would be the best area to search? Mackle settled on the Congo Basin. We obtained maps for the area and found that the area, although this was an ex-French colony, the area from which these reports came, the Congo Republic, not Zaire, we found that much of it, it was unexplored. And when we obtained the best maps, we found that the areas were labeled in white with statements like insufficient data to delineate terrain. And this delighted us greatly. So we decided to see if we could penetrate that area to see if there was anything to some of these reports. And we did just that. And the only way into the area at that time was on foot across the Vazier, the Great Swamp. The trek took many days most of them through waist-deep water and thick mud that released a cloud of stinking methane and hydrogen sulfide at every step. The temperature was an unbearable 32 degrees centigrade and the humidity very high. The expedition was under assault from poisonous snakes and every biting and sucking insect in the district. But they did make it into the target area and were able to talk to the local inhabitants. During the first expedition, to our delight, we found Eventually, after going through the great swamp on foot through the muck, that we found individuals of different ethnic, religious, and cultural and geographical backgrounds, first-hand eyewitness observers of the animal that they referred to now in another dialect, Lingala, not as Nyamala, but as Mokeli and Bembi. And the descriptions of these animals tally, that is, that the people of these different backgrounds gave us the same descriptions. And this intrigued me because if this were a cultural or, or religious construction, we would expect it to be associated with one particular cultural group, but not another. And this suggested to me that they were speaking about real animals rather than such a construction. And the stories came thick and fast. The animals described are 15 to 30 feet long, but most of that length is head, neck and tail. The tail is very long and thin, but the body more bulbous, like that of a hippo. They have stubby legs, and the hind feet have three claws. The animals are reddish-brown, have no hair, but some have a comb-like frill running down the head and neck. And in addition to collecting the monster stories, Mackel pursued another line of investigation. He showed the local people sets of animal pictures. We would show booklets, small drawings, of the known animals and also unknown animals to, as far as these people were concerned, including booklets of reconstructed fossil animals. And without fail, those people who had claimed to have seen the Mokelian Bembi picked out the sauropod dinosaurs as be representing the Mokelian Bembi. They looked at the pterodactyls, the Tyrannosaurus, and all the other kinds of animals. They did on some occasions identify pterodactyls and for this bothered us for a while until we established by further in questioning that they were referring to the large fruit bats which we have reached uh, wing spreads of one to two meters. All we can get from their descriptive anecdotal information is the general configuration and habits of these creatures. We cannot establish whether they're reptiles, mammals, or whatever. All we can get, their configuration, their description 
of the animals that were identified as bats rather than pterodactyls, the bats do look like pterodactyls, as a matter of fact. So we found further corroboration in that they described to us some other unidentified animals, including a giant monkey-eating bird and a giant turtle. In the meantime, we've been able to identify those as real animals. The giant turtle is Trionyx trionguis, which reaches the length of, in the literature, a, she a shell diameter of about a meter. And there are reports of the turtles up to two meters. Still. And actually, the, sh the uh, carapace, that is the shell, has been used for shields by some of the native peoples throughout the area. So they were correct about the giant turtle in the descriptions tally. And this gives us a measure of what a degree of accuracy we can attach to these native descriptions. The second was the monkey-eating bird, which turns out to be a rather rare giant eagle reported back in 1847. And this is Stephanidis coronatus, which is a great bird and does indeed eat monkeys, picks up small goats, and is a rather formidable creature, also known in the scientific literature. So again, we had a measure of comparison as to what degree of validity we can attach to these descriptions, acknowledging that we are doing simply the best interpretation and producing only working hypotheses and not suggesting that these are any final conclusions, but only the basis for further research, for further investigation. One factor that has emerged from the collected reports is the identity of the food on which these creatures are reputed to thrive. Already in 1914, the native peoples in, the, in this general area told the explorer, Friar von Stein Solausnitz, that they ate a plant called malumba. They appear to be amphibious, spending their time eating by, the, the pygmies tell us that the body is kept in the water and that the long head neck reaches out to pluck the malumba fruit from the vines along the river banks. This is a beautiful liana which grows on the riverside. It produces lovely white flowers, and has a milky sweet sap and edible fruits. And we found these plants to be exactly as described. And they are not particularly rare. They do go back to the Cretaceous and they're fairly widespread throughout Central Africa, also some in Madagascar. There are dozens, several dozen different species of these plants. We've since done analyses and find that they are very much in their composition like our domestic pears. But they have a low protein content, so that it, this is a difficulty for an animal living only on the fruit of the malumba. We have acquired information that the, the animals also eat the leaves, and perhaps not just the leaves of this one particular plant. They have to spend a lot of time eating, though. It's probably what they do do, except reproduction and avoiding being killed. And despite being sluggish plant-eating animals, they are given a wide berth by the local villagers. They are frightened of the animals because they say that when they encounter them in the river, they upend the dugout, spill the occupants into the water, and kill the occupants by biting and tail lashing. Hippopotamuses are herbivores. They eat river plants, but they're extremely dangerous, especially when you have a female with a, with a young calf. They, will, they can bite a man or a woman in half and are extremely dangerous. So just because an animal eats plants doesn't mean it's harmless or not dangerous. So the natives have a point. And on one occasion at Lake Tele, a lake in which Makele and Bembe had been seen frequently, one group of lake fishermen got tired of having their fishing interrupted and decided to do something about it. Probably around 1960, one of the animals, a Makele and Bembe, was killed as it was attempting to enter Lake Kelly through one of these little side branches of water. The pygmies were fishing in this area and the presence of the animals coming into the lake was disturbing their fishing greatly. So in spite of the fact that they were afraid of the animals, they, they built a barrier by driving stakes made from tree trunks into the water, protruding up out of the water, forming a sort of gate or fence across the opening. And when they observed one of the animals attempting to break through the opening to enter the lake, the story goes that they speared it to death, and it took forever to cut it up because it was long. It was so long. And the further story goes, and here we see again the mythification developing, 
They said all the people who ate of the flesh of this creature died very shortly thereafter. Well, actually, the lifespan of the pygmies is of the order, that is, the life, average lifespan is only 25 years. So it's not that long to begin with, so uh, we don't need to attach very much credence to that. I don't think it's very important. We see these kinds of mythification processes going on in connection with other animals, including some known animals. Time, unfortunately, ran out for Mackel and Powell, and they had to go back to the USA, tantalized by the stories, but with no concrete evidence. Mackel vowed to return, and so he did, with fellow explorers from the University of Arizona and representatives from the Congolese government. This time, they headed straight for Lake Tele, the almost circular, shallow lake that was thought to be the home of at least one family of Makele and Bembis. During the second expedition, we were able to push the whole thing further in that we actually were shown tracks of one of these animals, allegedly tracks of such an animal. Because the, the trail was old, there were simply depressions in the jungle floor, and they simply made a pattern that it, it was clearly something that had walked through the area and had torn up the jungle undergrowth to make a passage from a small pool about 300 meters from the Lakuala Osir River. Now, our informant told us, Emmanuel Mangumila, who was a great hunter and well respected in the area, that he went, when he went to investigate the nature of this animal, which was very frightening to the people in the village nearby, which was the village of Zeke, he found that the animal must have left within minutes of his arrival. He speculated that the reason was that woodcutters were making a lot of noise with machetes cutting wood. They would not come too close to the area, but the sounds reverberate to the jungle and perhaps caused the animal to leave. He saw even the droplets of water still on the foliage through which this great break had been made through the underbrush. He followed the tracks. His first reaction was that these were just the tracks of an elephant because it was very similar to an elephant's tracks. These are small forest elephants. They're not great savanna elephants. But he followed the trail of the footprints into to the river. Now near the river, the jungle undergrowth was absent and there was simply a stand of grass, perhaps a meter in height. To his amazement, he saw that the tracks went right through the grass and that the grass was flattened to a distance of one meter either side of the center of this trail. And he realized then that no elephant makes that kind of a track. My question to him at that point was, why could it not have been one of the large Nile crocodiles they reach lengths of 20 feet, and you can imagine that the heavy tail swinging back and forth going through the grass would flatten it, and it indeed it would. He became a little miffed with that and said, even you, Mondelli, meaning white man, could tell the difference between these elephant-like tracks and those that a crocodile makes. Furthermore, a crocodile would not break down the underbrush to make a path through it to the height of one and a half meters, and I had to agree with him. Now, unfortunately, when we arrived, it was months later, since the area was sort of taboo by now, the people are so afraid of these animals, nothing had been disturbed. So we could still see and photograph the breaks in the jungle and the depressions, although we couldn't get an excellent cast to obtain any detailed zoological data from the footprints. Naturally, by now, the grass was back to normal. So that's where it stood at that point. Except that is, for a flutter of excitement when rounding a river bend on the way from the lake, when the expedition members had a tremendous splash and spotted a 25 centimeter high wave that suggested a large creature had just submerged. Hippos don't live in that area, and the crocodiles that do rarely leave a wake. The identity of the creature, though, had to remain a mystery, for time ran out again for Mackel and his colleagues. But the information they had collected and the report they had written encouraged the Congolese authorities to send an expedition of their own to Lake Tele. It was led by Masala Ananya, a zoologist from Brazzaville who'd been on Mackel's second expedition. They reached the lake, and the first animal they saw was an enormous freshwater turtle with a shell that was estimated to be between a meter and two meters across, which would make it one of the largest turtles in the world. Then, one morning, there was a cry from one of the local guides, and Ananya ran to the lakeside. There he saw an amazing sight, Michaela Abimbi. The animal was in the water. I just saw the back, the neck and the head of the animal out of the water. And I know that in, in that forest, in that region, there is 
no mammals living in the water. There are some reptiles like crocodiles and some varans and so, some other lizards. But the animal was so was so big and great. The, the neck was like um, what I saw. It was like one meter out of the water, and the back was uh, like uh, three meters of large, and it was really exceptional. The back of the animal was black, and it was shining because the, the, the day was really sunny. And the back was shining, it was a black, a black back, and the neck too was black and shining. But the face, the, 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 the frontal part of the face was brown. It was really clear, something clear, and I, I, could, I could see the, 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 the eyes, the eyes of the animal. The head was red like, like a lizard head. And the animal was trying to look look at us and was was looking for us because I think we disturbed the animal and and start moving around and looking for us and we we, we, we stay um, like uh, 20 minutes looking at the animal until it went down in the water and progressively went down in the water a movie camera was switched on but surprise surprise it was set on the wrong focus but the creature that Marcelin and Nanya had had the privilege to see is thought by several commentators to be the sauropod dinosaur, a small version of Diplodocus or Brontosaurus. But all the dinosaurs were thought to have become extinct about 64 million years ago at the time of the Great Dying. Could it be that one group survived the catastrophe? Roy Mackle thinks there are grounds for considering this a possibility. We have millions of kinds of animals different species that have become extinct over many millions of years. Some survive and some do not. The areas where we have relic species, that is species that change very little but which are still present for over long periods of time, and some have been around for 200 to 600 million years, are generally found in areas that have been stable environmentally for those long periods of time. The species has adapted successfully, more successfully than any other group, and therefore they survive very successfully. Now, this part of Africa is like that. Since the Cretaceous 70 million years ago, there have been no changes in the area, major changes in climate. There have been no mountain building episodes, no glaciations, no inundations, no floods. In fact, the, the vegetation is very similar to what it was in the Cretaceous. That's why it's such a wonderful area for research. Now, certainly evolution goes on in every area, but when it's that stable, it's a likely place for a relic species to persist. The second criteria is it's an area which has not been explored and has not been penetrated. And that may, may be for different reasons. In the case of Africa, it's such an inhospitable area, full of venomous reptiles, various kinds of diseases, malaria, and so it is just inhospitable. And so when this area was a French colony, exploration was carried out to a certain extent, but the middle of the swamps were generally avoided. And this is just the reason why there may be something hidden in this area. The next point is that there are many other examples. In this very area, the crocodile, the, the Nile crocodile, was already well developed 65 million years ago. It is a semi-aquatic carnivore, that is, it's a meat eater. They reach lengths of 20 feet. Whatever is responsible for, and there are at least 30 different hypotheses as to what caused the extinction of dinosaurs. The most closely related living form to dinosaurs are the crocodilians. And they have survived very well. They, they survived whatever did in the dinosaurs at large. Now, there is no reason why a small sauropod, a small dinosaur, in that same area, which has essentially the same kind of habitat, habitat that is semi-aquatic, except that its food supply is vegetable material rather than meat, so that the two would not be in competition. It would be surprising indeed if such an environmental niche had escaped exploitation by living forms. There are at least a half dozen experts in the area of sauropod dinosaurs who have been questioned on this matter. And their attitude is, it is improbable that a dinosaur has survived, a small one now we're talking about in this area, but not impossible. 
So it's a long shot, and we accept and understand the low probability of this, but uh, that doesn't mean it's an impossibility, and we think there's good evidence that there is some unidentified animal involved here. Whether they're still there, we think so, because something made these tracks. Now, it may not be a dinosaur. It may be something else. It may be a large lizard. We would also be delighted if it, we come up with that. Uh, a 15 or 20 foot lizard is uh, pretty spectacular. So, with all the anecdotal evidence and the observations of the various expeditions, is Mackel convinced there are dinosaur-like creatures in the Congo that are worthy of scientific pursuit? We're never convinced, but we develop working hypotheses upon which we base f uh, further experiments, and these are subject to revision and change as we go along. My best judgment is that they are referring to real animals and that these are not referable to the known creatures in, in the scientific repertoire of living animals. I'm not suggesting that they're not uh, something that is present in the fossil record. But never would we make any claims. The only claims in the end we make are when we have the animal to present. But whether Roy Mackle has the animal to present or not, Marcela Ananya can only believe his own eyes. I'm convinced that, that the animal existed, but the, the problem is, is to de demonstrate, to show, to, to prove that it's really a, a living reptile and a, and a non reptile, or if it's really a living dinosaur. That is a problem we have to follow now. That is why we are planning to, to make another expedition to get a photograph or to get all the morphology or the animal to have uh, a surety of what it it is. And that expedition with Marcela and Nanya and Roy Mackle taking part is likely to be leaving early next year. If they find anything, be assured that the living world will let you know what happens. In the meantime, it's a sobering thought to realize that this kind of discovery is not new in science. At the beginning of this century, the Mbuti pygmies of the Utari forest, not that far away from the Lake Tele area, spoke of a strange creature that was half giraffe and half zebra. The scientific community said it was nonsense, perhaps a mutant zebra. But an animal fitting that description had once lived. It was called by the scientific name Paleotragus, and it was a browsing animal with two short bony horns on its head. It was considered to have become extinct about 20 to 30 million years ago. In 1900, Sir Harry Johnson explored the area and found an animal just like Paleotragus, alive and well and it fitted exactly the stories told by the pygmies. We call it the Okapi. <laughs>